Hello, my name is Eyes Good, and this channel is all about a game that I'm working on. A 2D survival game called A Struggle to Survive, set in early America around 1820 or something like that. Haven't nailed down the, the exact time that I want to start the game from. A lot happens during the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s in American history. And... Um, what I want to capture in this game is life, uh, the life of the, um, the trappers, the pioneers that went out west by themselves and um, made a name for themselves, surviving off the land, trading with the Indians, um, basically struggling to survive, which is what this game is going to be about. I wanted to give you a quick update on the progress I'm making on the game. And I'll probably do a couple of videos. This one is going to be about the the world map and the some of the issues I've had with uh, trying to get the map to render and and to render in a in a way that's performant and not distracting to the player. I have spent so much time trying to work out this implementation of the game world. And I want to share with you some of the um, some of the issues I've had, and also just kind of demo it for you to see see what you think. Now, what I've done is I've created a game world. There is a there's a little um, mini map up here, and this world is is pretty small. Um, but what I'm trying to capture with the game is the ability to create a game world that is very 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 large I'm talking millions of tiles but what I'm going for is an engine implementation of the tile map system that does not chunk so there's no chunking and what that means is is that I can have this or this is my goal anyway I can have this large map with all kinds of uh, areas to explore with a dictionary holding the tile map data and the tree data and all the other data in the game. It, it's all set up being stored in uh, resources, custom resources, and dictionaries. And it, it is working. It's, it's working well. I, um, I am able you know, to move around the map. The map has no edges, so the player actually will never see the edges of the map because when the player gets to the edge it wraps around um, both north and south and east and west so there's there is no there's no edge to the map and the map can be of any size that I want as long as I have memory to support the dictionaries that hold the definitions for the tile map I I can make the tile map millions of tiles in size now there's not just one tile map that I'm working with I have a tile map for the grass. I have a tile map for the water and the edge of the water, and um, these all work together to provide some uh, depth, a little bit of depth anyway, to the game world. And I'm still working on building out that depth. I, I want to have multiple uh, vertical layers to the 2D game world, and uh, you know, to simulate. Um, height and I'm, I'm sure you've seen many many games that have done that with uh, tile maps that have edges that you can't cross and you have to go up paths and around rocks and things like that so the uh, performance is it's not bad in in fact uh, I'm going to show you in just a minute just how good this implementation is but before I do let me just explain what I've what I've done so at the beginning of the game there's a loop of in GD script I'm loop I loop through the size of the tile map and I randomly generate using Perlin noise and using a seamless uh, image very important in the in the world a map wrapping uh, feature that I use a seamless image so that it, it it wraps correctly visually and then I've and then once the game world is is created the all the data for the tile maps the trees, everything is stored in dictionaries. And then, based on where the player starts, the map is generated only in the view 
that the player is in. So what you're seeing here is a view. It's a viewport. And based on where the player is in the game world, which in this particular spot, it's uh, tile 130 by 136. So this is the XY location of the player in the, in the world map. And as the, what happens is, is um, as the player moves, the player is physically moving. The camera's attached to the player. The player is physically moving to the east, and the movement is animated. And when the player reaches his destination on the next tile, something happens. The entire view is completely wiped, nulled out, and redrawn, meaning that all of these trees, all of these tiles, everything is redrawn the moment the player lands at, a, at his new location. Also, the player starts, of course, in the center of the view. When the player gets to that point at his new tile, the player uh, sprite is positioned back at the center of the screen. And all of this is taking place blazingly fast, I have to admit. I, I am so impressed with Godot. Um, and I'm not even in Godot 4 yet. I'm, I'm still in Godot 3.5x, whatever it is now, 3.5x2 or whatever. Um, or 352, whatever it is. But I am uh, very impressed with this. Now, this here doesn't look too impressive, right? I mean, I can speed up, run a little bit faster. Um, that's, not, that's not very impressive for those of you watching this video. But let me show you something. I'm going to alter the code. And instead of updating my position, when the player reaches his target, I'm just going to go ahead and update it every single frame and I want you to see what this looks like oh, you ready for this check this out keep in mind there are no chunks and every move repaints the entire view with the data from the dictionaries for the world for everything in it okay you ready here we go Let's do some diagonal movement. Now, what you're seeing is a viewport that is refreshing every tile the player moves. And you're seeing just how fast this technique is. I am frankly blown away. This, this is phenomenal. And what's amazing about it is, it does not matter how big the game world is. The game world size is not affecting the speed, the performance that you're seeing. Okay, let me prove that to you. Um, let me go up to my auto global. What you just saw was a world of 250 tiles by 250 tiles, okay? Let's crank it up. All right. Now check this out. Now it's going to take a little bit, right? <laughs> a lot more data, exponentially more data to generate. So uh, it's going to take a little bit. But that wasn't too bad, was it? I mean, 1,000 tiles by 1,000 tiles? You want to do the math so the the game world is now this size and in this uh, image that you're seeing this is actually the image that is generated from the height map remember I said that I was creating a uh, a wrapping game world based on a a seamless image well this is this is actually what is produced and each pixel it uh, represents each tile in the game so you know that's a lot of tiles right Okay, check it out. I am moving along in my dictionary-driven viewport. 
that's rendering all of these tiles at exactly, well, as fast as it can, right? And to me, this is positively phenomenal because there's no chunking. And it doesn't matter. It does not matter um, how big the map is. It, it's just going to run. Now, it's running so fast right now that the animations for the character are not even able to keep up. Okay? But that's this isn't the speed the game world's going to, to run in. Okay? I have a little bit of a animation catch up there. But I'm just trying to show you just how fast this is. This this is, what do you think? I mean, this is fast. Okay? So, the issue I have had with this, and let me just drop it back down so that we can talk a little bit. Okay, the issue that I have had is um, what I'm about to show you. And I have... That's how, by the way, that's how quick the 250 by 250 map renders. That's, that's pretty good. That's well over 50,000 tiles. Right? Is my, is my math right here? 62, yeah, 62.5. Anyway, that's a lot of tiles. Now, the issue that I've had with this implementation, and these are, these are speeds. This is a uh, tracking speed. Oh, I did not turn off. Hold on, let me fix something here. Let's do it when the player reaches his target, not in between. Restart real quick. So the issue that I've had, these are these are uh, speed for the player. That's this is tracking speed. He's tracking his prey. This is uh, walking speed, and this is running speed. Now this will be unless the player is on a on an animal like a horse or a mule this will be the the speed of the game um, but here's what I want you to notice and this is what's been so frustrating to me see that little bit of hesitation there now that hesitation is taking place the moment the entire view is refreshed okay and it, it's I have I have refactored my code and tried I know it, a dozen different ways what you're seeing here is the result of the best of those ways to refresh and if you're watching this video and you are a game developer you're working in Godot and you know how to fix that little bit of a hesitation I would love for you to post and tell me how but this is the best that I've been able to do okay and honestly I hate it. I hate this hesitation. All right. Now, I know that you know maybe I'm expecting too much, um, but I don't think that it's too much to have smooth play, even though the entire view is being refreshed. Now, you might be asking, "Eyes good? Why? Why are you taking this approach? Why are you refreshing the view? Um, you know, every single tile. You're you're wiping. You're you're completely erasing everything and and um, redoing. You know, recreating the entire uh, scene. That's a legitimate question, and it is one that I asked myself. I thought to myself, you know, take for instance this spruce tree here. When I go from here to here, th this is actually each tree is its own instanced scene. So I thought, well, what if I, what if I basically make all of the trees in a, in a, in a one cycle of rendering. If, if I make all the trees that are in the scene invisible, leave them in the scene tree, make them, make them invisible, take step, you know, or, you know, once I get to my step, make them invisible, and then write some code <clears throat> that says, okay, Here's a dictionary of all the trees that are in the scene. And I just moved, the player just moved. So which which of these trees would now be out of the view and thus not necessary to render? And I had some out I wrote some code to do that, and I removed those tree objects from the scene tree, and then I brought in the ones that were uh, new to the scene based on the position. Now, I know that Godot 
already handles this when the object moves out of the view that Godot dumps them, but I didn't know that at the time. I kind of discovered that as I was working on this. So Godot was one step ahead of my my uh, approach. And however, however, I did implement it. And do you know what I found out? I found out that the Godot engine can actually re-instantiate these scene nodes and add them to the tree faster than they can delete than, than it can work with just deleting the node and recreating it as I originally did. Now that shocked me. I was very surprised by that. And I had I mean I, I did I did some timestamps and I, I checked how fast, you know, the view rendered when it got to the end of the you know to the to the target spot when the player reached the target spot and it does this complete wipe and complete refresh and I refactored the code and I turned the trees off and you know made them invisible and then I made them visible again and then I cleaned up the edges to get rid of the trees that had fallen off and then I found out that Godot already did that and I'm looking at the tree I am looking at the uh, the scene tree and at you know in, in real time and I'm seeing the trees get created, the trees fall off, they get recreated. You know, the instance IDs are incrementing, and I, I was, I was very, very, very shocked that Godot can just simply recreate these scenes. These each tree being a scene, right? It could recreate those scenes faster than it could hiding them and showing them. That blew me away. Seriously, that, that was very, very impressive. So I threw away all that code. And then I started looking at how I'm, how I'm dealing or, or how I'm uh, determining when the player reaches the destination. There is a ton of ways to do that. Okay. Um, what I found that ended up working the best for me, let me show it to you. So um, in my input event, I'm getting the direction grabbing my keyboard input for moving the player. All right. I am determining where the target position is based on the X and Y uh, input values. And then once I get that target position, I basically, I have a, I have a, a function up here that's basically checking to see if the player's moving. If the player's direction is not equal to vector two zero, which means vector two zero, the player's not moving. So if the player is moving, then I check to make sure that the animation sprite for idle um, is playing when the player is not moving. But if the player is moving, then if the target is not equal to vector two zero, then I set the position. I set the position, and then this this right here. Wow! When I realized I could do this, this this saved me a ton of headache because I was moving with. Uh, slide and all the other different ways of moving the the sprite around and um, you know move and slide and all that and what I found out was um, I was fighting against the physics engine and the slide effect where my character was even was bouncing even more when it reached its target but this here this worked great the reason it works great is because move toward will never overshoot its target. In other words, when when the player is moving, move toward will stop the player when it reaches the when it reaches the target. So there's no guessing as to when when the position down to you know five six uh, float decimal values. You know you don't have to fool with that with this. You just move toward it, and when it reaches it, it'll stop. So you know, to the target times delta times player speed. And then I do my animation to make sure my animation is keeping up or, or at least, you know, trying to keep up. And then when it, the animation runs, um, we process a new position. And in this, met, in this function here, sorry, I'm a C-sharp developer, so methods is what I'm used to saying, but these are functions in Godot GDScript. And I'm eventually going to rewrite all of this into C-sharp anyway, because I hear that uh, the C-sharp implementation is a little bit faster. Um, the process new position basically says, okay, hey, if the position equals the target, okay, 
then we're going to update the map player tile, set our direction um, to vectors to zero, set the target to vector to zero, which, and then what we do, this is where the player gets recentered. Self position equals view center. View center is the center of the view. All right, and then I do some stuff with the flora, another part of the game. And then I update this update map player tile. I have some dictionaries, some global dictionaries. I call them auto. Um, these these global, I'm sorry, global scripts. I have dictionaries in these global scripts. Um, singletons for C sharp developers. Um, I set the basically update for the direction. And then I set the map player tile position, the new position, and then back down here in my world generator, I grab the new position. There's a, there is a signal that I pick up there, and I regenerate the view. This is the fastest that I've been able, this is the fastest code. This produces the fastest, smoothest movement, okay? You would not believe how this has changed in the last month, because I've been trying everything under the sun that I could think of to make it move faster. But this is this is doing good. And um, so I've got a I've got a a tile map, a set of tile maps that are a game world that has a wrapping world because I'm using a seamless tile or seamless image to generate the uh, um, the world, the game world uh, using simplex noise. And, you know, my player is, uh, is able to move around and, and, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm too much of a perfectionist. You tell me, what do you, what do you think? I mean, see that stutter? Doesn't that just aggravate you? It aggravates me. And, uh, I would love to come up with a better solution that's just as performant without having to deal with chunking. The reason I don't want to deal with chunking is because chunking can end up producing that exact same kind of stutter. Maybe not every move, but um, and I don't know. I have less than a year in the Godot engine, and maybe some of you that you know have lots and lots of more experience with uh, Godot than I do can give me some advice. Uh, you might say, "Eyes good, you're doing it all wrong, man. Just lean on the lean on the chunks and let the engine take care of it for you." And I hear you. Um, I haven't tried it, I admit, I have not tried it, but going into this project, I really wanted to see if I could get performance that was acceptable by recreating the entire view every time. And honestly, I've been extremely impressed with this. This has been very impressive, especially um, coming from Unity, which is what I started. There's some other videos, some older videos on this channel that are the Unity project, and I, you know, I switched to Godot, and I'm, I don't ever intend to go back. This, I love Godot, I really do. Um, anyway, tell me what you think. If you enjoyed the video, if you got something from it, if you, you know, feel free to like. If you want to see more videos like this about my game, A Struggle to Survive, um, you know, consider subscribing. And um, I thank you for spending a few minutes with me today. I appreciate it. Until next time.